into our conversation series, Dr. Michael Lee. Dr. Lee is Associate Professor of Theology with affiliation in Fordham's Latin American and Latino Studies Institute. Born in Miami, Florida, of Puerto Rican parents, he holds a graduate degree from the University of Chicago, as well as his undergraduate, another graduate, and his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Lee joined the Fordham University faculty in 2004 and teaches courses in Roman Catholic theology, liberation theologies, Latin American and Latino theologies, Christology, and spirituality. He served on the governing board of the Catholic Theological Society of America and as president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States. His commentary has appeared in a wide variety of venues, including the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and El Faro Academico at El Salvador. He's also appeared on networks, including CNN, Al Jazeera America, ABC, NPR, and Radio France International. He's an author of several books and articles, including Bearing the Weight of Salvation, The Soteriology of Nazio Elakea, which won the 2010 Hispanic Theological Initiative Book Prize, sponsored by the Princeton Theological Seminary. His newest book, which Dan had so early today, very good, Dan, is Revolutionary Saint, The Theological Legacy of Oscar Romero. In this work, he examines Romero's context, life, and theological works. And he asks the question, how do, or how should, Christians think and live differently after Oscar Romero? Or your question as well as to ponder in our own spiritual journeys. Dr. Lee's scholarly activity had always been complemented by a commitment to practical engagement. He served the homeless, he lived in the Andre House, which was a Catholic worker inspired community. He has served as the liturgical musician at St. Simon in Jude Cathedral in Phoenix. He facilitated Spanish language RCIA programs. And he's on the board of Christians for Peace in El Salvador. We have been fortunate, a group of us, to share the last few hours with Michael. And we had very invigorating conversations. And I know that it will be a delight for all of us tonight. Let us welcome Dr. Michael. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me fine? Thank you. What a, what a wonderful in, uh, introduction. My goodness, I need to bring you around even more often. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the introduction to Father Sierra for inviting me and to all of you for welcoming me here. It's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here and to speak about this remarkable figure. We know the bad news. In Central America, it remains the poorest region in Latin America. Half the population lives below the poverty line. In rural and indigenous populations, the numbers are even worse. According to the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the poorest 20% receive only 3% of the region's income. In addition to poverty, there are environmental crises. Metals mining in Central America has meant displacement of communities, poisoning of water supplies, uh, destruction of forest land, skyrocketing rates of kidney disease, and many human rights abuses, including the murder of Honduran indigenous activist Berta Cáceres in March of 2016. In the last six years, the two countries that have had the highest murder rates in the world are El Salvador and In our own country, we know the struggles over immigration and now the current debate over DACA and TPS. All difficult news and difficult times to think about coming from Central America. 
In an attempt to address these and other pressing social issues of our time, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, in documents like Evangelii Gaudium, Laudato Si, and his most recent Amoris Laetitia, has tried to address these and called, in his kind of common thread to these documents, called the Church to take on a preferential option for the poor in its life and its decision-making. But I believe the Church and the world needs models, lived examples, of the Pope's exhortations, of this vision to be laid out uh, in this remarkable papacy. And so I would turn our attention to Blessed Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of El Salvador, beatified in 2015, some 36 years after his assassination. And what I'd like to suggest tonight is that he serves as one of these models, as one who in his personal life, in his ministry, in his office as Archbishop, models a way for individual believers and for the Church itself to live and serve in this world. Of course, remembering Romero is not the easiest or most simplest ta of tasks. In their sorting out the effects of La Matanza, the 1932 massacre of indigenous peasants that profoundly shaped the imagination of 20th century Salvadorans, my colleague Hector Lindo Fuentes and his collaborators used the notion of memory communities to discuss how groups of people interact to find voice, shared meaning about events. So rather than seeing memory as a static recalling of past events, the notion of a memory community helps us to appreciate the constant negotiation that takes place in articulating a historical memory. Whether it be a, a massive hurricane, a, the American Civil War, uh, one's high school years, even last year's Super Bowl, memory involves dynamics that are individual, and collective, fixed in some way, but also malleable. The one who remembers brings something to the memory itself, and memory communities must perennially negotiate the meaning of a memory in complex ways. This lecture remembers Oscar Arnulfo Romero from different and overlapping memory communities. I stand here today as part of that generation that came to adulthood during the Salvadoran Civil War. A generation that saw the Reagan White House make the Salvadoran conflict center stage in the global conflict with Soviet communism. Just as a previous generation had been defined by the war in Vietnam, so my generation came to see El Salvador not just as a foreign policy debate, but an entrenched battle that shaped political identity. For those involved in the grassroots movement opposed to U.S. foreign policy in the conflict and in Central America in general, the March 1980 assassination of Archbishop Romero linked with the December murders that same year of four U.S. church women came to symbolize the evils of U.S. intervention in the bloody civil war. For others, the memories of Romero's death was a different lesson in politics. As a Latino growing up in Miami, I witnessed the vitriolic nature of this conflict in a particularly acute way. In a city home to many wealthy Salvadorans who had fled northward, Nicaraguans who had left because of the Sandinista victory in their country, as well as thousands of Cubans who had escaped the Castro regime, the political battle lines were sharply drawn I can remember how at my Roman Catholic parish, two married old missionaries invited by the pastor to share their experiences in El Salvador were showered with boos and epithets of comunistas by agitated parishioners. Early on, I came to recognize the deep-seated convictions of ostensibly very kind and generous Christians who could also utter statements like, it is awful that they have killed priests down there 
But if they were communists, they deserved it. To this memory community, Romero's story symbolizes not the dangers of the U.S. empire abroad, but the perils of communist incursion and an object lesson of engaging the wrong politics. Remembering Romero or forgetting him in the United States powerfully links to a fundamental vision of our country's role in global affairs today. Politics, of course, isn't the only area of conflict for those remembering Romero. Faith itself is being negotiated. Within different faith memory communities, the memory of Romero serves to interpret the role of the church in the world, particularly in light of the papacies since the time of Romero's death. It's not a simple question of content. Catholic social teaching over the last century has been consistent in its criticisms of capitalism as much as socialism, and in advocating a vision of justice and equality, championing values such as human dignity, solidarity, and the common good. However, there is a certain style, a manner of being in the world that's at stake. For some, a, a pious, spiritual Romero represents the values articulated by the anti-communist John Paul II and an anti-secularist Benedict XVI, who both prized loyalty and uniformity in the church imagined as embattled in the world. Yet for those who value the vision for ministry voiced by Pope Francis of pastors living with, quote, the smell of the sheep, Romero's priority on accompanying the marginalized resonates deeply. Rather than an embattled church, it is a field hospital church that cares for the wounded, defending them and not its own place in the world. Who is Romero for us? Remembering Romero requires consciously acknowledging the located nature of our memories. It'd be presumptuous to pronounce one memory as the correct memory of Romero, but it would be just as foolish to devolve into the simple relativism that, well, everyone has his or her own Romero, who is untouchable and equally valid. Memories are shared. Debates are collected. And that is why we examine Romero's legacy these days. When we do so, we participate explicitly in the negotiation that are all a natural part of memory. Much of the contestation over Romero's legacy surrounds his relationship to liberation theology and how it is understood by memory communities. There's the question of Romero's legacy in El Salvador itself. What was his relationship to the subsequent civil war that would take place in the 13 years after his assassination? There's the larger question of Romero's legacy across Latin America. How can he be judged alongside other revolutionary figures, for better and for worse? What does it mean to embrace liberation theology? What does it imply? And how have those who have given voice to liberation theologies been caricatured unfairly? Who are the faces of liberation theology? Is it Che Guevara, who did not approach revolution from a Christian perspective? Might it be Father Camilo Torres, the Colombian priest who joined the guerrilla of his own country, but who died four years before the book of Theology of Liberation was even published. Truly, Romero is not like these, so he must not be a liberation theologian, or so it goes. In terms of liberation theology within the Roman Catholic Church, the documents of the Latin American Bishops' Conference of 1968 which took place in the city of Medellin, Colombia, served as a landmark moment in its foundation. In addition uh, to Medellin, uh, one of the priests who was uh, a principal writer of the documents of Medellin was Father Gustavo Gutierrez of Peru. And his book, Teología de la Liberación, is for many the foundational text. 
Now, according to Gutierrez, the most important idea coming out of liberation theology is the preferential option for the poor, a theme that was taken up quickly in magisterial documents and has become, as I suggested earlier, a center point of Pope Francis's own ministry. And so tonight, I'd like to suggest that Oscar Romero was not a professional liberation theologian. He did not publish any books. He did not publish journal articles. But I would argue that he is liberation theology embodied, that his spirituality and his ministry in the Archdiocese of San Salvador are one of the lived texts, finest examples of liberation theology and spirituality that we can look to. And yet in many ways, he was quite an unexpected candidate for this position. A brief look <coughs> at his career, born in 1917 in San Miguel, his is uh, the entrance into priesthood of many, many in Latin America. Uh, those who were intellectually talented were often sent to Europe. And so in the 1930s, he leaves El Salvador for Rome. In fact, he's ordained in Rome, but because of the circumstances in Italy during World War II at the time, he's sent back to El Salvador. And in 1944, he celebrates his first Mass in Ciudad Barrios, his hometown. After a brief parish stint, then, he's a diocesan secretary in San Miguel, who eventually becomes the secretary of the Salvadoran Bishops' Conference. In 1970, he's named an auxiliary bishop of San Salvador. And in 1974, finally, he's named the bishop of a diocese, a rural diocese, called Santiago de la And in 1977, 60 uh, years old, he is named Archbishop of San Salvador. And what's remarkable is that right up until that 60th year, Romero's life, his ministry, would probably have passed away into history into oblivion. We would not be speaking about him. Uh, no books would have been published about him. It is those remarkable last three years of his life as Archbishop of San Salvador that brings him uh, to global attention. Nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1978, enshrined in Westminster uh, Cathedral with a statue next to martyrs of the 20th century by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Martin Luther King Jr. And so, um, how did this come about? Um, what was that profound change uh, that occurred in Monsignor Romero's life that we would speak about him now? Part of what made it unexpected was the training he had received in Rome. The theology in which he was trained, the so-called manual theology in the neo-scholastic tradition, uh, and I won't get into too many details here, but it stressed um, a, a strict dualism, a consideration of the supernatural and the natural, uh, a soteriology, a thinking about salvation as future-oriented, a vision of church that was very hierarchical, and a Christology that focused on the mysterious nature, the mysteries of Christology so-called high Christology. On the ground, it translated into a spirituality that tended to be fatalistic. In El Salvador, to be a Christian often meant to tolerate uh, situations of poverty and injustice in hopes for the life to come. And yet we see in Romero's spirituality, in his life, Three important dimensions that I would like to lift up tonight. The first is the notion of conversion, a conversion that he himself undergoes and extensively preaches about. Secondly, a, a notion of faith in politics, a vision for Christian discipleship in the world. And finally, a, a, a new understanding of martyrdom martyrdom of his own, and much that we can learn about his own preaching on martyrdom. 
from so many of the deaths that were occurring in his archdiocese. Comet provides us a new way of seeing conversion, not simply as just a coming to faith or a position from no faith to faith, but rather the calling of all Christians to recognize the depths of sin. And crucial in Romero's growing realization was not simply sin at a personal level. His, his life was marked, if anything, by scrupulosity. And if you read diaries of his from the 60s, he's uh, just punishing himself for all of his wrongdoing, uh, making promises to be more strict in his already very profound prayer life. No, it wasn't that uh, Monsignor Romero was a prodigal son who turned from great sin uh, to redemption. For Romero, conversion involved his immersion in the reality that was emerging in El Salvador. His predecessor, Luis Chavez y Gonzalez, was Archbishop of San Salvador for almost 40 years. And under his leadership, a new theology began to emerge in El Salvador as Oscar Romero was becoming a bishop. Archbishop Chavez encouraged theological training in light of Vatican II and of that landmark meeting of bishops in Medellin, Colombia. He sponsored cooperatives and other social initiatives aimed at alleviating the plight of the campesino population. Now, institutionally, there are many currents that lead to profound changes in the Salvadoran church. Among them were uh, many of the priests who were involved in building small base communities. Perhaps the finest example is the Jesuit priest, Father Rutilio Grande. Grande, much like Romero, studied in Europe, but he also trained at the Ecuadorian Institute for Pastoral Ministry that was set up after the bishop's meeting at Medellin. In 1972, Father Grande was made pastor of the rural area in towns of Aguilares and El Paisnal. The methodology he, he mobilized his pastoral team with was the uh, inheritance of Catholic action, its so-called see, judge, act methodology was powerful. So then he established mission zones, and in the first year, his team simply went about trying to find out the reality of the poor citizens of this region. As one elderly woman put it, what I remember most about Father Grande was that one day he asked me what I thought. No one had ever asked me that in all my 70 years. That listening transitioned into evangelization sessions in which they provided guidelines for communities to celebrate uh, liturgies, to read the Bible amongst themselves and raise up leaders among the population who could minister daily. You have to understand the ratio of priests to uh, believers in the church in El Salvador at the time is about 1 to 10,000. So there wasn't much contact uh, with priests and with formal ministerial training. Grande's team attempted to change it in these small communities. And these communities took off. As one woman put it, who was a product of these communities, we used to go to church like water jugs, just waiting to have water poured into us. Our faith was a borrowed faith. The priests allowed us the privilege of understanding the gospel in the manner that they explained it to us. We have learned that we have a treasure within us, the life we have lived. And if we take that lived experience and reflect on it collectively, we see that we ourselves have something to share with others on the journey toward God's reign. In just the first two years of his ministry, Father Grande had 37 base ecclesial communities working with over 326 catechists or delegates of the word emerging from them. 
Over 700 baptisms were performed at that time. In addition to the base communities, the so-called centros de formación were organized that would continue the catechetical training of these uh, delegates of the word, these community leaders, along with education about the situation uh, of their country, economic, political, and social. At the same time, within the Salvadoran uh, University, the ACUS is uh, the uh, Catholic Action Organization of El Salvador, you began to see more intense study, uh, again, political, economic, and social, of the reality of the country that was influencing Catholic uh, scholars, Catholic elites in the country as well. So in all this context, what we see emerging in El Salvador is a liberation theology that's based on this see, judge, act methodology. With an understanding of the gospel, in Greek it means good news, euangelion, a good news to the poor, as the gospel of Luke says. A profound realization of sin, not just in its personal form, but in social forms, in social structures. With a faith that's not a fatalistic uh, endurance of situations of injustice, but an understanding of God's will as human flourishing. To pray, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, is to participate in that taking away of the world's sin. Of course, it also meant the experience of persecution as well, and as we shall see shortly. Christ is worshipped not only as a victim, but as a liberator as well. And the church is not simply a gatekeeper of doctrine, but the community and the supporter of the efforts for justice and for peace. Of course, in those days, the language wasn't of liberation theology. It was the issue of Medellin. I took this political cartoon from a, a uh, Salvador newspaper in the 70s, and you'll notice on, on the right side, the crucifix, the Jesus uh, holding a firearm at his side. And, and underneath it says, the attitude of the bishop's conference is a return to the good path. This, political cartoon came about just before the bishops were to meet again uh, at the uh, 10th year anniversary of the Medellin meeting. And the rumor was going to be that this meeting in Puebla, Mexico, would reverse everything that had happened. Well, that was the hope. It didn't turn out that way. What was Montevideo Romero like in the face of this emerging liberation in theology? Well, one would have to say that as he became Auxiliary Bishop of San Salvador in 1970, he was not supportive of it. In fact, we see several examples of him uh, criticizing this sector of the Catholic Church. He was generally suspicious and antagonistic toward those involved in the base communities. In 1972, he clashed with the base community of a neighborhood in San Salvador named Sacan. The National Guard had just invaded uh, the university and shut it down. Uh, several were killed, others arrested and disappeared at this event. Um, in the newspapers, uh, it was said that it was closed because it was indoctrinating communism. And uh, Bishop Romero in the diocesan newspaper supported the government's position. Uh, needless to say, in a meeting with the space community, there were uh, disagreements over this editorializing by the, the auxiliary bishop. He scolded seminar, seminarians who had boycotted uh, celebrations and the national feast day. Uh, the national feast day is August 6th in El Salvador. It's the transfiguration. The country's name, El Salvador, the Savior. Um, but because of political corruption uh, in the presidential elections of that year, seminarians were chosen to Boycott, for which Romero uh, criticized them harshly. And then finally, uh, in what's called the Externado Affair, um, uh, the local Jesuit high school, the Externado San Jose, uh, was teaching sociology classes in which they had students actually leave campus grounds and learn about the poverty uh, 
in, in their country. Well, many of these were the children of, of families, of the wealthiest families in the country, who again uh, accused uh, the high school of indoctrinating their sons in communism. And when looking for someone within the church to support their cause, they found Auxiliary Bishop Romero, whose editorial and orientation of the diocesan newspaper spurred a national investigation. Indeed, the, what would be the, the nation's attorney general opened a hearing on what was going on at this small high school. In the end, the school and the teachers were acquitted, but Romero has staked his reputation on opposing these movements within the church. In a homily at the National Cathedral and in memos written to the Vatican, Monsignor Romero uh, criticized the liberation Christology of the Jesuit priest, John Sorino. Things began to change, however, as he became bishop in a rural diocese called Santiago de Maria. Yes, he had continuing difficulties with one of the formation centers there. But he also began to understand the reality of this country in a new way. A rural part of the diocese, it was the heart uh, of the coffee harvest. And so workers, poor, uh, itinerant uh, harvesters would come from all regions to participate in the coffee harvest, one of the few times of the year that they could make money. Their lives were difficult, and uh, in light of many who were sleeping outside, uh, Romero opened an old school <coughs> building uh, for a place for these campesinos to sleep. And in conversations uh, over cups of coffee, Romero began to learn of their reality, learn of their abuses, of those who would cheat them uh, after 16, 18 hours of backbreaking labor. This began to change his perspective. Tragically, in his own diocese, in a small town called Escaes, uh, the National Guard, under the cover of night, um, kicked in the doors of two houses of uh, leaders suspected of some community organizing. Uh, the father was dragged out and murdered in front of his family. His two sons were taken away and shot in a barn about 100 yards away. Romero rushed to the scene and writes movingly in his diary about these mothers who were tearfully telling him stories about their uh, murdered loved ones. And when angry priests in the diocese demanded that he make a public letter demanding justice for these murders, Romero felt an internal conflict. While he felt great sympathy and horror over these deaths, he felt that it was best to move in private channels. He knew personally the president had him in his phone book. We had books those days, not electronic devices. Um, and said, I will contact the president personally, but I don't want to make a public scene and cause scandal for the church. So we see in this period a uh, Romero who's whose awareness of the situation of this country is growing, but still a timidity, a nervousness about what the role of the church should be in this time of, of what really was becoming revolutionary change. That timidity seemed to evaporate in March of 1977. The previous month came the shocking announcement that Oscar Romero would be named Archbishop of San Salvador after the retiring of uh, Archbishop Chavez. Many in the progressive sector in these base communities were depressed at the thought. Ugh, Romero, the one of the externado affair, the one who kept his mouth shut in tres calles. Him? On March 12th of 1977, while driving his jeep between the small towns of Aguilares and El Paisana, that Jesuit priest, Rutilio Grande, who was a personal friend of Romero's, they had lived together at the Archdiocesan Seminary, was murdered, shot to death 
along with the two passengers in his car, 87-year-old Manuel Solorzano and 14-year-old Tito Lemos. Those deaths shocked the nation and shocked Monsignor Romero. We see a picture here of Romero's installation as bishop back in 1970. And who is at his side, the master of ceremonies, Father Cotillo Grande. And so to see his murdered body 70 years later, I think it shook Romero to the core. And that process that had been happening from the time he had begun to be a bishop in Santiago de Maria came um, to a peak. And in the wake of that murder, Romero made the momentous decision that the funeral mass for Grande, for Sorozano, and for Lemos would be the only mass celebrated in the whole country. The so-called Misa Unica. And while many in the base communities and in other churches celebrate, almost dumbfoundedly so, this miracle, they said, uh, of Romero, others uh, were more concerned. And when Monsignor announced that he would be boycotting the July 1st inauguration of the newly elected president, General Carlos Humberto Romero, uh, that consternation became um, just a direct outrage. For instance, a fellow member of the Salvadoran Bishops' Conference, Bishop Jose Alvarez Ramirez, could not countenance Archbishop Romero boycotting uh, the election. As he said, we find in this designation the hand of God. The president-elect is the established authority. All authority comes from God, and we Catholics, the Church, are with the established authority. The accusation to Romero was, how could he make the office of Archbishop political by boycotting this inauguration? To which Romero's response was, when was it not political to have an Archbishop at a president? Inauguration. The papal nuncio, Emmanuel Gerada, uh, just uh, uh, excoriated Romero, brought him to his office, and, and uh, one observer noted, scolded him as if he were a child, uh, warning him that his duty as archbishop was to maintain the relationship with the government, with the state. Indeed, reports flooded Rome. And uh, Cardinal Sebastiano Baggio, who was prefect of the Congregation of Bishops, called Romero to Rome, and he too scolded him for uh, his political acts and for uh, disunity with uh, the government. And yet Romero emerges as a new person from this period. Those as his biographer, James Brockman, said, those who had once been so suspicious in his eyes became his closest collaborators. He turns his ministry and focuses it on those suffering majorities in the country of El Salvador, and so embodies a kind of a conversion in his ministry and in his person. He had always been a, a frail health, Often seeing a doctor um, catching colds, and it, it may be hagiographical memories, but it's it's interesting how many said those illnesses, that frailty, vanished as he began these new steps as archbishop. That conversion meant a different view of faith and politics. Romero counters the notion that faith is occupied only with so-called spiritual matters. Rather, he sees the spiritual in the material. As he says in his second pastoral letter, the element of transcendence that ought to raise the church toward God can only be realized, can be realized and lived out only if it is in the world of men and women. Not away from, but in the world. 
of men and women. In his famous lecture on the political dimension of the faith, Romero makes four central points. Uh, he talks about uh, the political dimension of the faith and of the church, not as an if, but a how. After all, politics in its most basic form is the life of the polis, the city. And the church, as he said, has always had a place in that city. It's not an if of politics, it's the how. His turn is to the world of the poor that he describes as the key to unlocking the reality of the world. And in this way follows and continues uh, the vision of Vatican II's calling for us to obey the signs of the times. In reflecting on the Christian mystery of incarnation, of the Lord taking flesh, human flesh, Romero talks about a church that incarnates itself in the world of the people. Sin, in this view, is not simply the violation of rules. Sin is the violation of God's will for human flourishing. And that needs to be addressed. So just as Jesus incarnates himself in our world, the church must incarnate itself in the world of the poor, proclaiming the gospel, real good news to the poor in offering hope and support in their struggle for liberation, commitment to defend them and to lift up their agency, and finally enduring persecution because of doing so. He looks to the Gospels and sees in Jesus' ministry there three dimensions. First, he says, Jesus denounced sin. And so in his own ministry as Archbishop, his homilies in the Sunday Cathedral became legendary. They would be broadcast over Esox, the Archdiocese and radio station. And it was said that in many towns, you could begin on one end of the town and walk through. And because every home had radios with Monsignor's homily playing, you could walk from one end of the town to the other without missing a word. You always hear Monsignor's he preached the scriptural readings of the, of the liturgy that day, but in addition to those uh, scriptural passages, he would turn to the news of the week and the life of the church. Uncensored accounts of events, he would condemn the basic structural injustice of his country and denounce uh, repression. If there were cases of uh, massacres, of uh, kidnappings, you would hear the Archbishop preaching about them, and in doing so, denouncing the particular sins in his nation. A second dimension of Jesus' ministry, according to Monsignor Romero, was the proclamation of good news to the poor. That took on institutional form in his establishment of the office known as Socorro Judicial. It literally means uh, uh, mercy, merciful help, and judicial and merciful help. An office that, uh, whose mission was to document human rights abuses. Um, so if a call came in to uh, the Archdiocese that there had been a massacre in a small town, this team of lawyers would jump and go to them as quickly as possible with a photographer, um, take down uh, evidence, uh, testimonies, whatever they could get their hands on to document the human rights abuses. Um, it became probably the most valuable resource to the United Nations Truth Commission that operated at the end of the Salvadoran Civil War. And I think it's a powerful symbol to say, well, the documentation of human rights abuses, that's a, that's a social issue, or that's politics. But for Romero, it was a mission of the church. It was important that the church's office was there, uh, on the ground where human rights abuses were happening. In addition, he had the Archdiocese support organizations like Comadres, uh, the Mothers of the Disappeared in El Salvador. And uh, in reality, an organization that would not have survived were it not for the legitimizing support of the church itself. And finally, the last part of Jesus' ministry, of course, is his persecution and his execution because of his proclamation of God's reign. 
It's a picture of Eugenio Alas, a Salvadoran priest, who had received the white hand. The white hand was the trademark of the Union de Guerreros Blancos, the UGB, a famous death squad. They claimed responsibility for the murder of Crutita Grande, the Jesuit priest. They are the ones who sent out a letter saying, every Jesuit in the country needs to leave within 30 days or they'll all be exterminated. To receive the white hand meant that your life was threatened. In fact, a, a classmate of mine from college who was working with Catholic Relief Services up in the north in Chalicanango had the white hand painted on her car and she had to flee the country. Um, this was a persecution taken on by the church for its stance. And because of it, we come to a new realization of martyrdom in our own time. In ancient times, perhaps at the hands of a pagan Roman emperor, to die in the hatred of the faith was one context. But Romanos shows one in which faith has lived out causes a hatred, brings on a persecution, even by those who ostensibly think of themselves as Christians, as good Catholics. In addition to Rutilio Grande in 1977, Monsignor Romero had to preside at the funeral of Father Alfonso Navarro. In 1978, it was Father Ernesto Barrera. In 1979, it was Octavio Ortiz. Rafael Palacios and Alivio Macias. Murder after murder, and these were just of the priests. One gets into the hundreds and into the thousands as one talks about the catechists and other campesinos involved. To tell you a personal story, a woman I met who was involved in Father, Father Grande's pastoral team. One of their works was to teach literacy. Many of the campesinos found that when they were harvesting coffee, they'd come to get their bags weighed on the scales, and they didn't know how to count. So they found that the wages they were getting were unfair, and all they wanted to do was to be able to read and write to make sure that they were being paid what they were promised. Well, it was a successful program, and within a few weeks, uh, the, 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 uh, the man paying at the scales, the middleman for the landowner, was quite disturbed at uh, the demands of protests that, that were beginning to happen. Um, later that week, uh, four men kicked in uh, this woman's home, put a hood over her head, dragged her out of her house, and threw her in the trunk of her car, drove her, and when she came to consciousness, she found herself in a kind of dungeon cell she didn't know where she was, but she endured days upon days of horrific treatment. Treatment that I don't even want to detail, the use of electricity, so on and so forth. All hit names, those who were cooperating with her. Finally, the days of torture um, were so devastating to her that uh, she apparently passed out. So that her captors thought her dead and deposited her body with other bodies. Uh, fortunately, someone who was walking in the distance heard a cry. Uh, I forgot to tell you, she was eight months pregnant when this was all going on, and the trauma of torture induced labor. And she says to this day, my baby saved my life, because it was his crying that was her. The baby died two days later. She fled the country and currently lives in the United States and works with trauma victims of torture. Her crime was teaching people to read and write. That's what made her a communist. And that's what killed Monsignor Rodel. In the months prior to his death, he received threat after threat. Threats in the mail. Uh, for this, I found this in one of the archives. A letter from the Falange, one of the other uh, death squads active of the country, that says, the swastika, 
Symbol of the diehard enemy of communism is our emblem. We have a long list of priests, professors, workers, students, and employees who we will be eliminating. You, Monsignor, says the letter, are at the top of the list among the clergy who at any moment will receive some 30 bullets in the face and chest. Nevertheless, we want to save you if you comply with our instructions. And they give a list of instructions like public apologies during his homilies and denouncing the work of the base communities, etc. And they end the letter with the ominous phrase, we will be watching. On March 24th, 1980, Monsignor Romero was murdered in a small chapel adjacent to the hospital for cancer patients where he lived. The prior day at his Sunday cathedral, he had taken perhaps his most bold statement yet. He called upon the members of the National Guard not to kill their fellow Salvador. He said, the, the order of God is higher than any human order. And so he asked them, he begged them, he pleaded them, he ordered them, stop the repression. There's a story by the ones who were operating the radio terminal that was broadcasting the homily. They said, at the moment that Monsignor Romero uttered those words, I order you to stop the repression. All of their equipment got loud stacked. Now they had been bombed twice. The radio tower had been bombed twice. And other times, the government had used effective devices for jamming the signal. And so they thought, oh no, they jammed the signal again and they're working with equipment. When they realized that in fact what it was was the entire congregation applauding. The length and the volume of that applause <laughs> frazzled their equipment. Uh, but it also drew notice, and within 24 hours, Monsignor Romero was murdered. This is a mural on the wall outside the small hospital chapel where a congregation of nuns gave a residence to Monsignor Romero. He did not wish to live in the large palace usually reserved for the archbishop. A small room, a bed, a desk was all he needed. And he, in denouncing the sins, denouncing the powers, uh, took on the fate of those uh, whom he served, the many other Salvadorans, who in this powerful mural take on not only the marks of Christ, but the bullet, bullet wound of Monsignor as well. So how do we remember Monsignor Romero? The Archdiocese of San Salvador in the 2015 beatification came out with a motto, Romero, Martyr for Love. Love is a powerful thing, but there were many who were not happy with this designation. As the Jesuit uh, president of the university, former president of, of the university, Jose Maria Tojeda, said, Martyr for love? For love of what? We need to be specific about the love for which Monsignor Romero was killed. Romero was a hope of the poor. And it would be wrong for us to try to construct a false middle, an extreme right on one side and an extreme left on the other, and Monsignor Romero somehow in a vague um, no place on the middle. Romero's conflict with those on the right possessed a different theological vision about the role and the place of the church in the world. Yes, he had conflicts with those on the left, and some in the communities he felt were moving too fast or were engaged in a partisan politics that compromised the faith. But his disagreements with them were strategic. He shared a vision with the communities, with the theologians, with these priests, of a church immersed 
incarnating itself as good news to the poor. We cannot separate Monsignor Romero from the others who walk the same path, like here with Rafael Palacios in Amigo in the town, in Palacios, his, his town. We can't water down Monsignor Romero's message that recognizes the colonial legacy of his country and the structural legacies of poverty and injustice that were a part of his country. And they force us in the United States to look at our own long structural histories, like slavery and racism in our own country, and to address them in similarly powerful ways. Romero is one with his people. And I think of the work of the biblical scholar Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, who admonishes us not to think of Jesus as an independent hero, but as part of a Jesus movement, of a community that he lived and worked with. We cannot separate Romero from that uh, people. His Episcopal motto was the phrase from Ignatius of Loyola, sentire cum ecclesia, sentire, to, to think, to think, feel with the church. And he lived out that church in a powerful way, in a church of many voices and many strands making up this powerful tapestry. Romero is an icon for our times. What do we see? I think we see good news but one that challenges us as well as comforts us. And our mission, as I see it, is to participate in the negotiation, the contestation, the understanding, and to give our own answers as to what his own, what his sainthood will mean for the church global. Only we can answer the question, martyr for love of what? Thank you. Questions, we have the microphone there, and I'd like to ask questions too. We'd be happy to answer. 
Salvador now. Uh, how does one give an update on the state of the church? <laughs> um, in terms of? Where are they with regard to standing with the poor or with the poor? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, a, a mixed place. Um, you know, on the one hand, you don't see the kind of, uh, well, I would say positively, there are still many in the base communities that are very active. But I would say that, unfortunately, uh, many of those base communities who were once tied to parish communities have separated. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon that in those base communities you see the emergence of women as leaders. Um, you know, during the war, of course, there were so many men that were killed. But I think also just the opportunity for women to exercise leadership um, was socially innovative. Um, and many of the pastors could not function well with women leaders. Um, also, you had an Episcopal leadership for many years. Many who, although they might praise Romero in words, uh, basically carried out structurally a reversal of what Romero was doing at the Archdiocese. Now, having said that, um, the, the current uh, Archbishop has come out with two wonderful pastoral letters. His letter on the environment and the, uh, the growing movement of the church around issues of mining and against, uh, you know, El Salvador as a country passed a moratorium on uh, mining and then um, the uh, Pacifica Gold, the international company, sued them in the Inter-American Court. Their resources are much deeper than the entire you know, GDP of El Salvador. But, um, but the church was a strong presence in, in denouncing uh, the abuses that were taking place in terms of mining. And then the Archbishop also had a powerful letter on gang violence. It really uh, spoke well and spoke with a, a knowledge about the reality of the country and where the violence started and not simply blaming the gangs, but realizing where the gangs emerged from poverty and displacement issues from the war that continue on in the violence of the country. So I'd say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed reality in the country right now. Um, it, it is painful to see uh, in our own country, though, the, the debate over, over DACA and the ending of TPS. It's just another, um, another blow to so many Salvadoran families who have suffered terribly. Um, who are separated in part because of our country's involvement in our civil war and now are, are you know, just uh, abandoned. And for young children who know no other country, no other language to be told, leave and go to this country that you don't really even know, um, it's a frightening prospect. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the postulator is the Archbishop uh, uh, Alia. Um, you know, um, you hear the reports, you know, the, it's, it's imminent, it's imminent. It's, imminent. Um, it, it's, it's funny, um, Julian Filatowski, who was a former journalist who first met Romero in 1978, and he was covering the Corona Conference of Asia, um, you know, has been uh, head of the Romero Trust in the UK. Julian was one of the principal uh, kind of catalysts for the British Parliament's nomination of Romero to the Nobel Peace Prize. Anyway, he has his ears to things from Rome, and according to him, I had talked to him because the book came out, and, and he said, oh, perfect timing, Michael. I think the canonization announcement will be coming in the next month or so. I said, what? Next month? Are you sure? Sources, you know how it goes. We've been disappointed before, but he seems to think it'll be this year. So, sell a lot of books. Ah, we'll see. people need to, you know, nighttime readers. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Yeah. So you mentioned in the in the talk 
uh, Romero's early uh, suspicions about the liberation theology. Uh, but then, of course, your talk is the liberation spirituality. Mm -hmm. So how did uh, Romero's relationship to, because obviously you talk about basic communities, but how did his relationship to liberation theology develop over time up until you know, the time of Right. So uh, unlike a scholar, you can't say, well, in this book, he makes these moves. Um, you see the ideas in his preaching. Um, you could say concretely, for instance, John Sobrino, uh, who he criticized and suspicious of. Well, John Sobrino drafts his second pastoral letter for him. And his very famous Louvain address that he gives in February of 1980 was also drafted by John Sobrino. So if he distrusted that liberation theologian so much, he wouldn't have him writing his stuff for him. Um, but I think in terms of content, you know, his, his, this reading of transcendence, this notion of transcendence, <coughs> is, reflects the theology of Ignacio de Puglia. Uh, his taking up the theme of, of the preferential option for the poor, I know he was deeply influenced by Gustavo Gutierrez and by the bishops' conferences of Medellin and Puebla. So you see it in his preaching and, and in his homilies. Again, um, with Romero, you have this remarkable coincidence of not just thought or ideas, but a life that, that lives it, that proclaims it in that way. And I would say personally and institutional, which I think is one of the most important parts. We are talking about a holy man, but we're also talking about a man who made the church holier. The church, uh, uh, in the language of Vatican II, was a true sacrament of salvation that, that mediates that which it points to. So, um, so in that way, you know, it is a liberation of spirituality because it combines the thinking, the theological thinking, with this lived example. Um, but I, you know, th there is the attempt to try to separate Romero from liberation of theology. One of his biographers tries to do that unpersuasively, I would say. Um, but but I, I think this is based on old caricatures. Um, there's, you know, when, when you see it lived out in the manner that I have seen it in El Salvador, and you see in a figure like Romero, um, you have to move beyond the caricatures and prejudices. Yes? Uh, Romero's um, he was he was uh, devoted, you know. He he would uh, pray with the Opus Dei community. There was a bit of a rift when he became Archbishop. Um, it was said that the Opus Dei community actually did celebrate its own mass instead of going to the Misa Unica that he called for them, and that created, I think, uh, I don't know. I was more disappointed than anything else. Um, but he continued, um, you know. There was a confessor who was an Opus Dei priest that he continued to visit. So he maintained a relationship uh, with Opus Dei. I would say, though, that there was a, a distancing on him becoming archbishop. And uh, although he admired Opus Dei for the dedication of its piety and its uh, devotion to prayer, it was uh, the inability to convince them of a, a greater participation and social commitments that disappointed 